Hi there and welcome to this episode 12 in the Rethinking the Human Factor podcast, a podcast show for information security professionals all about raising awareness, influencing behavior and fostering an appropriate organizational culture where information security is truly valued. My name is Bruce Hallis, I'm the host of the show, and I have the absolute privilege of being able to interview a wide range of guests from predominantly outside of the security industry to get their insights into how they have, as practitioners or as researchers, addressed the challenges of awareness, behavior, and culture within either organizations or even across nation states and groups of nation states. In today's podcast, we're going to introduce you to a lady who actually comes from the health and safety arena. And it's not unusual when I find myself in conversation with CISOs and education and awareness managers around the the human factor to sort of ask questions or draw analogy or draw upon experience that's happened within the health and safety sector in terms of how they've addressed the challenges of awareness, behaviour and culture. So when the opportunity was presented to me of seeing somebody who's doing some great work and who's really getting to grips with the behavioural aspects rather than just seeing it as an awareness cultural issue, I jumped on that and I sent them an invitation to connect on LinkedIn and they got back in contact with us really quickly and said they'd love to come on the show. So it's going to be an absolute honour to introduce you to this new guest. But before we do, I just wanted to reach out and say thank you to everybody at InfoSec. So at the beginning of June, we were invited to present some ideas around the human factor at InfoSec, which was held in London. And uh, we got some absolutely fantastic feedback. And we just really appreciate the opportunity to bring some of our ideas from the, our rethinking process around the human factor to the stage. And you know, we were blessed with the opportunity to do a keynote presentation. So I just want to say thank you to InfoSec for inviting us and for everybody that attended as well. Hope you found it of some interest. I wanted to let you know that I've been working on a book and it's called Rethinking the Human Factor. And really, I guess in many ways, it's almost like a philosophy about how we need to rethink the human factor in terms of seeing the challenge maybe slightly differently and using that difference to take a slightly different approach. And that book comes out in six weeks. And the great news is it's not a big book. It's only 20,000 words. The whole idea is that you can probably read it in a day or if you haven't got enough time, a whole day free, you could probably cover the 20,000 words in a week. So that's what we decided to do. Keep it short and to the point hopefully get some really interesting insights. Part of what the book has done is to pull upon the interviews that we've done with this podcast, but it also pulls upon the broader research that I've been doing around the human factor challenge and opportunity. So that comes out in six weeks time. Now, one thing you'll notice if you go and have a look at the book, which by the way, you can get a free chapter at uh, marmaladebox.com. Go there, get a free chapter, get some insight into, you know, where the book is going to, what sort of direction the book's going to be going. There's some new branding there, and this is great. We've spent maybe four months working on new branding for uh, Rethinking the Human Factor and Marmalade Box, which is the company I set up to help with organizations addressing the Human Factor Challenge. And that branding is now all over the new book design, but also that branding is there on the podcast. So if you're used to seeing the old brand for the Rethinking the Human Factor podcast, I just need to give you a heads up. We've got the new branding there. so. Yeah, please have a look and let me know what you think. You know, we spent a lot of time thinking about what our values were and then sort of trying to develop a brand and an identity that supports that, which is something that a lot of our guests have been talking about on the show. So without any further ado, let's get on with the interview. Hi, Sri. Uh, great to have you on the show. Um, now, do you think you could just let us know a little bit about your background, the journey that you've been on to get you to this point? Okay, sure. Thank you for having me, Bruce. Uh, so my name is Sue Yi. So how I actually got into safety and health, you know, it's it was quite a journey. I didn't just fall into it. So let me just give you a bit, some background. I started doing biomedical science. So my research and my doctorate was in biomedical science. Okay. Um, and then from there, I went on to do some lecturing in an institution of higher learning in Singapore. Mm-hmm. So that's where I'm from. Um, and somehow, while lecturing, I then stumbled into the school's human resource office. Okay. So it was part of like you know some kind of rotation. So I ended up in that office, and that was where I ended up doing things 
like employee engagement, workplace health promotion, and just a tiny bit of workplace uh, safety and health. So it was nice being in this office because they wanted some perspective from the academic, you know, how, what would the academic staff want, um, you know, in terms of human resource policies and benefits and workplace health promotion initiatives. So I really got very interested in how people work in an organization in general. Okay. So that, that gave me, you know, this passion to create environments that is safe and healthy and most importantly, happy for workers to thrive in because I think I have this personal belief that one shouldn't be leaving work, you know, when it comes to work and then they shouldn't leave work at the end of the day in a worse state than they have been in, you know, whether it's in physical health or mental state or just, you know, happiness in general. Yeah. So right now I'm still in an institution of higher learning. So I'm still in a school, but in mm-hmm. another one. Um, and I'm dealing a lot with workplace safety and health that is quite particular to an academic setting mm-hmm. and with quite a bit of interest in safety culture, so safety and health culture um, in general. Okay, okay. So really, it sounds like, you know, when you made that move over into the, um, the university office, mm. that that's where your interest got ignited in terms of it's great having all these policies, okay, um, mm. HR policies, health safety policies, those types mm. of things. You know, somebody's taken the time to write these, so you would hope that that mm. means that they're actually, you know, important or value. But yeah. then the thing that ignited you was, okay, how do I actually take those and create an environment within which people are willing to comply with that? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And that's interesting because you use the words create environment, and that's one of the things I, yes. I'm really interested in is the whole concept of choice architecture and how you design environments mm. to enable people to make what we might con- consider to be better choices, you know, on the whole. So it's interesting to just speaking to you straight now. I'm like, oh, wow, look, listen to this. You're talking about creating an environment, which is choice architecture. We're talking about policies, which all people mm. in, in my industry, every, you know, there's lots of policies, persons, procedures, but the challenge is the same yeah. challenges in health and safety. How do I make people aware exactly. of that? Yeah. yeah. And how do I influence behavior? It was brilliant. Okay. Now, just to let the listeners know, you and I have never spoken until today, have we? <laughs> Yeah, no. <laughs> no, no, no. And just let the listeners know, you've got to go and check out Sui's uh, LinkedIn profile because I saw John Scott, who is uh, an education awareness manager for um, a central bank, and uh, he mm. highlighted one of your posts, which was the post of the challenges around influencing behaviour about crossing road. Do you just want to mm. – can you remember? I could just maybe share what that, what that post was because I – it was a fascinating. If people go and find your profile, they should go and have a look at that post. Sure. Okay. So it was this video that I posted. So the challenge with traffic safety is, you know, we have our pedestrians who don't look at the lights and they just cross whenever they want. So the idea was how do we change the behavior of our pedestrians in a way that is fun so that they would comply with um, the traffic lights. Mm-hmm. So in this video, what they did was they set up this dancing booth at the pedestrian crossing. And while the lights are red, someone can go into this booth and start dancing. And when they're dancing, the lights that are red would also dance according to um, the person's movements. So that made people stop to look. And it was really fun. So people wanted to stop. They wanted to wait for the lights to change before they cross. And that really helped to get the outcome that was desirable. So something that was fun and interesting and engaging could change the behavior of our jaywalkers. So that that really interested me, and that's why I shared that on my um, LinkedIn profile. Yeah. You know, when I showed it to my girls, uh, who are quite young, but they, they love dancing, the whole idea mm. of, of, you know, somebody dancing and that it's being filmed and that it was coming up on the traffic lights so the, yeah. the, the red person would start dancing. And they, they absolutely loved it. And, and that's the thing, I think, for people on the road who were stood there, when you saw the video footage of it, the people on the road, they were drawn to the red person, but the, mm. they were drawn and they stayed there. They yes. stayed looking at it. And then when once one person watches, somebody else then looks, then somebody else. And that's the whole social peer thing going on where yes. you know, people are like, what is it everyone's looking at? And when they all start looking at it and they get and they, they got they got pulled into it, then the only time that they turned away 
was when the red person stopped dancing, which was when the green person then said, let's walk. That, that, that's basically what was going on, wasn't it? Mm, that's right. And yeah. I think when it comes to safety, you know, when we want to change behavior, a lot of us think that, you know, it should be through punishment. You know, you give this person a fine for doing something unsafe or we give them a slap on the wrist for doing that. And we think that that changes behavior, but it might not be sustainable in the long run. So how do we then use something more creative that is more positive to change their behavior and then reinforce that later so that this behavior sticks with them until it becomes second nature? So, I mean, you raise a really interesting point. It's something in my in my particular industry, the whole idea that, you know, it's the carrot and the stick type of thing. You know, if you, mm. if, if you comply, here's the carrot. If you don't comply, here's the stick. And the stick is, yeah. if it's on an individual basis, it's probably, you know, disciplinary. If it's as an organisational-wide sort of approach, it's here's a regulatory fine or, or something like that. Mm. In the health and safety uh, space, mm. have you got examples of that where, you know, it, it just doesn't, the policy's there, mm. people can be disciplined, but still people carry on. And from your particular industry, is there any sort of reasoning behind that? Why people choose not to comply, even though they know that there are actually sometimes quite serious consequences to them? I think, um, so there are a few points to that, like to me. So there are a lot of challenges with implementing safety. So especially in the Asian culture, Asian companies, you know, the bottom line is always the focus. So in a university, we like, how many research papers can we churn up? In another organization, how much money we can make. So safety becomes something that actually contraindicates, you know, increasing productivity and output. Um, Mm -hmm. It is often looked down as extra administrative processes or, you know, extra paperwork. It's a waste of time. So once it's being viewed as something negative like that, you know, something that punishes, something that waste our time, something that is not the focus of the company, it is really difficult to implement any safety initiatives or programs um, in that company. So that mindset of, you know, it being the thing that is stopping me from making more money or stopping me from churning up more research papers is the first reason why it is so difficult to implement our safety programs. And Also in this Asian culture, you know, we don't talk that much. Um, It's a bit more difficult to give feedback without people getting defensive. It is difficult to talk freely about safety without, you know, it being viewed as an aggression um, to the people. So that's another challenge that we see with implementing safety. And another thing is people just generally don't think that it's going to happen to me. Mm-hmm. it's yeah. going to happen to the other person it's going to happen to someone else it's yeah. not going to happen to me so it hasn't happened to me for 20 years I don't see why it's going to happen for me next you know it's something that is just psychology they just think that that it's not going to happen to me yeah. uh, until it does and then yeah but someone else will then still be continuing with those thoughts yeah so I think these are some of the challenges and until we make safety a second nature, you know, that is something that they just do. It's something that they just think of. It's some, something that, you know, they act naturally. Then it's going to be difficult to implement all these um, programs and let them take it up naturally. Mm-hmm. So I mean, one of the things, just picking up what you said there, I mean, a number of points, mm. but the, the, the first one there you talked about you know, within the Asian culture, which mm-hmm. uh, just to be clear to our listeners, uh, Sui is uh, based in, in Singapore. Have you worked? Yes, in, that's right. Yeah, yeah. But the work that you do, has that been limited to Singapore or, or have you covered a broader part of the region? Um, so I was previously working in Australia. Okay. Um, but right now my current work um, covers just Singapore. So the okay. University of Singapore. Okay. Yeah. So um, going back to the point you made, is you know, really the culture is, is one mm. which is very much focused on the bottom line. Now, can yes. I ask you, is that like a national cultural thing or is that an organisational culture that the bottom line is mm. um, what people focus upon? Because i tell you why I asked that question. Is yep. that often within an organisation, the people you're trying to, you're trying to influence different types of stakeholders. You try to influence the, the executive, the board, the leaders of the organisation, and mm. they have one view. But actually, you go and talk to the people who are actually at the operational cutting edge of things, where things mm. actually get done, mm. that there's often a difference in terms of culture. Uh, and often 
what you get there is you, you have the sense that there is an organizational culture, but it's different at different levels within the organization. And then you've got this bigger culture, which is, you know, um, the the local culture, the, the national yeah. culture. So do you do you think that when you talked about Asian culture being bottom line, do you think that's more a mm. focus on in terms of the leadership or do you think that the overall culture is one of, you know, the bottom line and, and, and getting mm. down to really what counts? Okay. So I think um, when it comes to focusing on the bottom line, you know, pushing out papers, you know, making more money, I think that is quite a uh, national culture kind of thing. But you're right that, you know, even within the organization, I think that the leaders have so much, you know, so so much importance in setting the, the tone, you know, of whether uh, safety should be a priority or not. Mm. Uh, um, and I, I was just going, I was going to come to that as well about the leadership's um, position and their, their role in creating this positive safety culture. So actually, before we go into that, let me just talk a bit more about the difference between safety culture and like a national culture in general. Okay. Let me just give an example of um, Singapore culture. So something that maybe our listeners would not be so um, tuned to, you know, because it's something very specific to Singapore. Mm-hmm. Okay. So... Um, as you know, our country is very population dense. Yeah. We frequently go to hawker centers for lunch. Mm-hmm. Okay. So um, these are these huge food courts that have, you know, different stalls and then um, tables in the middle where you can just bring your food to the table and have your lunch and then uh, go back. So we have population dense. Everybody goes to a hawker center. It's very crowded. You don't really have seats. So we have this very interesting thing that Singaporeans do. We would put a packet of tissue paper on the table to say that that is my table. And then we go off to buy our food. Yeah. Okay. So we call this the chop culture. Okay. So we put it there and then we go off to buy our food. Mm-hmm. And then when you come back, your table is still there because you have already put your packet of tissue paper and nobody will take that away and nobody will question you. And yeah. you won't come to say that, that, you know, you can't sit there because you weren't here first. I came first, but right. you, you have already, you know, booked that reserved that table with that packet of tissue. Yes. And why I'm, I'm talking about this is because there is no law in Singapore that dictates, you know, a packet of tissue means you have reserved the table. You won't go to jail, you know, if someone else comes along and, and sits on, on this table. But nobody does it. It's because it is a behavior that's accepted by the society and everyone follows it. Yeah, It's just how the things are done around here. So extrapolating from that, you know, can we develop a safety culture that is also something that is the way we do things around here. So you don't need the laws, you don't need the policy, you don't need to say that, you know, if you don't do it, you'll go to jail. Can we have that kind of safety culture mm. that is similar to what I just described? You know, we just do it like that. That's just how we do it in Singapore. Yeah. And to do that, that's sort of like the, to bring us back to the original points you were making, you know, if you, mm. you strip out the policy, the process and the, the sort of procedures, though I think process yes. procedures are still there, but definitely policy. If you make something as frictionless as possible. Yes. You make it as easy for somebody to comply with something, okay, yes. then um, they're more likely to choose that behaviour. And then yes. if, and if that behaviour is consistent over a period of time, it then becomes the social norm that you're talking about. So exactly. If, yeah, yeah. So, so eventually you don't actually need the process because that's just how things are done around here. Mm, so that's the gold standard that we want. Yeah. Yeah. So we sort of picked up there the point of friction, which I'm an absolute mm. believer in. You've got to humans by their nature, and this is important. It doesn't matter whether this is somebody in Singapore mm. or here in the in uh, the UK or somebody down in um, in in South America. Mm. We t- we tend to try and find the point of least resistance. <laughs> yes. Um, which is another way of saying we tend to prefer to do things uh, we're, we're a little bit lazy, arguably. And that's where the friction comes in. The more hoops you put in, the more friction you put in, the more likely people are not to want to pursue that particular route. It's just, it's, it's just yeah. embedded in our DNA, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Is, is there anything from your experience around health and safety mm. where you can think, uh, yeah, you know, it was being done this way, but actually – just by simplifying it and making it easier, we were able to then change change behavior. Actually, so what I think is that with safety culture, it's so let me just elaborate a bit more about that as well. So 
before I answer your question. So it's defined by that set of shared values like you mentioned and that beliefs about the safety which would result in how one would behave. So it's defined, you know, in terms of your working practice, your tolerance for risk and how people deal with accidents or near misses. So let me give just one example of safety glasses. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we know that when we need to enter a laboratory or somewhere that has um, has hazards that flying around. Okay, you need you need to wear safety glasses. Mm-hmm. Okay, so when you tell them that safety glasses is compulsory because it is good for you, it is something that you need to do. You put a policy and a sign that is outside that door to say that they have to do it. Usually, the compliance is quite low because your safety glasses are comfortable. Some say that you know I'll get a headache at the end of it. I just don't want to wear it. I can't see properly when I'm. Yeah. when I'm wearing the safety glasses. But we know that it is good for them. We know mm. it is something that will protect their eyes. So how can we then change the behavior to encourage them to wear that into the laboratory? So there are a few things that um, we've seen, you know, that can be done. Number one is you need them to take ownership of this. And how we do that is, you know, we say, okay, your leadership, your management will say, I would commit the resources to you. I will let you purchase the safety glasses that you want so you can Say I prefer one that is a bit more comfortable on the eyes. Another one says I prefer one that looks better. Whatever you want. Okay. So first you need to have that commitment of resource so that they can take ownership to say, I will go and buy a safety glasses that is good for me. Yeah. And then we need to create that awareness so to say that safety glasses is not just something that um, you have to do, but it's something that is going to protect you. So you raise awareness through, you know, road shows. You let them make up posters of their own, you know, let them be more aware of what happens, what's the consequence if they don't wear um, the safety glasses. Mm. So then they start to think when they start to you know, take part in competitions or, you know, poster making, they start to think what, what happens if we don't wear these safety glasses or safety goggles. Yeah. And then we also have to engage people who are on the ground, you know, what we call safety champions. So these safety champions help to rally the cause for you because yeah. your safety staff, you have maybe one to a hundred, you can't do everything. Yeah. You need to have these people to to encourage the rest to say that I'm a role model, look at me, I'm wearing my safety glasses. Make it something that is acceptable and the norm. Mm. And then people will just start to follow, you know, have that conversation going in the laboratory of why this safety glasses need. It's like positive peer pressure. Yeah. And then we need to reinforce that. So how do we reinforce that to make it a, a behavior that is sustained through? Yeah. And I think that's where we come to whether we make it um, a positive reinforcement or a negative reinforcement. So do you then punish someone for not wearing or do you encourage a, a, a lab group uh, who has not have any demerit points? You know, we, we encourage and we reward them and make them the poster boy yeah. um, for, for this lab goggles so you know in summation all these strategies can help to change something from a very negative point to a very positive point because people get hyped up about it we win Mm. we're winning competitions we're getting rewarded um it's being seen as a norm and after a while everyone would just adopt that and it becomes that Mm. shared value that i mentioned and you know it becomes that shared behavior that is just keeps being reinforced now because everyone just keeps doing it yeah. So we have seen that happen. Right. Uh, as an example of how it changed from just you know something that's a policy to something that got everybody involved. So I think that involvement of everyone from the leadership who commit the resources all the way down to your student who mm-hmm. is you know a user of this glasses. Yeah. Um, you need to get every level involved to make it work and to make it successful. Yeah. It's really interesting when you started off there when you talked about ownership. And Mm. basically giving people the ability to buy their own safety glasses. Mm. And it brings me back. Recently, I did a presentation and actually in the webinars that I do as well, I talk about something called the IKEA effect, which is a name given to a bias that, that we all have, where we tend to value things that we've either bought or made. Yes. uh, More than if somebody gave us that same thing or made it for us. And it's that sense of um, by empowering people to buy the gu- their own preferred glasses, it sort of takes away the justification that they normally have for not wearing something, which is, yeah, 
it feels uncomfortable. Well, if you bought it, you've tried it on. You know, yes. it's the wrong color. I don't like, you know, even things like yes. color, you know, yeah. It, it, yeah. It, it's theirs. They bought it. They made the choice. It's, and so you're plugging into that intrinsic bias, the IKEA bias, mm, that's which right. is a very powerful bias. And so it's great to see, see it being leveraged there. But then you've mm. gone on to talk about awareness and, so, you know, making people aware of the consequences, why we're doing this. Mm. That's obviously important. Um, I think that I, the, one of the points I really like is the reinforcing, because often mm. um, in, in my industry, I'm not sure if it's the same with, with, within health and safety, but there's often the talk, mm. the language you use is about raising uh, awareness, inf- you know, influencing behaviour. And actually part of that whole stream, it's not just about trying to change those levels, it's about maintaining them. And that you know mm, you, you, right. need, yep. you need to reinforce those people that are doing the right things that they are doing the right things because yep. they need to they need to be recognised especially where maybe there are people in their environment the the working environment that still choose not to comply you need mm. you, you need to get the message across to them it's the it, it's it's the counter to the fact that they look at other people who aren't necessarily do it but the, you know that in their mind they know no, I'm doing the right thing here. It, yeah. they're the ones that aren't doing it so i think re- the point about reinforcing is really mm. really important but the point i'm going to ask you to maybe expand upon is the question mm. of rewards rewarding yeah. behavior because i hear a lot of people talk about uh, prizes and all those sort of things and that's great but i've also done a lot of research where it suggests that the prizes they become the end goal rather than just a means to the influencing behavior uh, have you got any views on that? So I think so I, I get uh, what you're saying. So, you know, we should be looking more at uh, a lot of papers say that you should be looking more at intrinsic motivation more than the extrinsic. So you should be looking, mm-hmm. they should be motivated from within. And it's not just because they want to get a prize or because they want to get a reward or recognize, you know. So my view is that rewards help to kickstart a process. Yeah. So it helps to kickstart when they are just at the infancy of developing this positive safety culture. And then once the ball starts rolling, you know, once they start going, then you can take this um, positive reinforcement out so that it becomes um, self-regulated. You know, it's something that they are doing it because they have been doing it all along. So I think that it is something useful to just Kick it, start, kick start it down, rolling down the hill. And then once it starts rolling down the hill, it just keeps going. So yeah. that is my my view. And just to talk a bit more about the reinforcement. So how I think safety culture is a bit different from, say, the national culture is that, you know, with national culture, it's okay to be different. It's okay that people are different. There is no good or bad, right or wrong. Mm. But with safety culture, there is, I feel there is a scale. There is a positive and there is a not so positive. Mm. So there is two ends of a scale. And I feel that if we don't reinforce, it is possible for a positive safety culture to go back to Mm. the negative state, which is not what we want. So I think that when we just, if you look at it as a scale, you know, when we are at the left end where, where it's negative, the positive reinforcement helps to push it, push it, push it to the right of it. And then after a while, it just keeps going on its own. So that's that's my opinion of uh, reinforcement, at least. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to take us back a little bit further to the point where we were talking mm. about feedback. So this is where we were talking about um, when you're engaging with audiences, how mm. sometimes the audience doesn't necessarily give you doesn't respond to you in the way that you're anticipating and it's possibly being driven by a sort of a national culture so I'm, i've got a great example where mm. I, I was working with an organization and they had offices in west coast in the united states uh, the united kingdom scandinavia and hong kong okay and um what we wanted to do was to create, um, it was going to be a lot of air miles, but the whole idea was that we were going to do face-to-face. They wanted us to do face-to-face, sit-down discussions, group discussions with a variety of stakeholders at different levels within the organisation. And um, they wanted us to do that to basically get an independent view of the security brand. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So it would be a bit like, you know, what do you, you know, when I say health and safety, 
What does that make you feel? What values do you associate with? All those type of things. Yeah. Um, and we were having that conversation and they sort of, uh, this particular client had this view to go, okay, so we're going to, uh, so we'd like you to go and do a discussion here, 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 and here. And they sort of mapped it out. But then I had to come back and say, well, we don't really know anybody in China and Hong Kong in your offices. And the challenge that we could see is that something just being put down in front of a group of people that you don't really know and asking them a series of questions, which because of the national culture, they may actually, it might be that they're looking to go, um, they might take some form of offense to it, or they might, um, mm. or they might actually turn around to one individual to represent them mm. rather than giving their own individual. So, which is a very sort of, it, it, to me, I think the interesting bit is the, the difference between sort of Western, Anglo-Saxon, mm. but there's other obviously Western cultures as well. And then how things are done in the Far East and how that affects how, you know, an organization has got operations all around the world. Mm. Does it need to understand the cultural context to better design even the ways that it reaches out Yes. To people. So I like to use this phrase called you know, corporate oversight and local governance. Okay. So you can have your big parent corporate oversight where they come up with you know, your policies and your programs. But I think that you need this local governance. So the different country offices will need their own little safety team that understands the culture and understands how people act um, in the country to be able to take these policies and implement them in the way that fits that culture. Mm. So, I mean, even within our university, we have thousands of staff and they are in different departments. Even within this organization, the different departments can have different culture. Yeah. So even within different faculties, they act differently. So we find that having people who are within the department or within the faculty implement these policies in their way, in their, in their special way, as long as the outcome it's the same and its outcome is desirable. I think that is the way that we want to do it. Mm. And these would be the champions that you were talking about. With, you know, That's that, right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And what sort of, how close a relationship does that have to be? I mean, do you have to be working very closely with them over a period of time? Or is it the sort of thing, you know, this is what, what I see reasonably, reasonably common, is where um, the champions are out there and then, so there's engagement with the champions, but it's only around, you know, mm. we've got something specifically we want to, to push out. And does the relationship with the champion have to be one about listening to the champion as much as talking to them and telling them what you want? And do you actually have to have an ongoing relationship rather than just waiting, you know, we do a campaign once a year or once every six months and that's the only time we talk to them. How do you develop that relationship with the, with, with the champions to get the best out of them? Mm, it's a great question. So I think, so let me start with the safety champions and what, you know, who they are. So I think the safety champions have to be a mix of having your safety professionals and those who are not. So it could be someone just from the department um, who is not a safety person, but who's someone who also believes in your cause. So that's someone that you can, you know, rope in to say that, hey, let's work with you. So we have to have a mix of these two types of people as safety champions. So one to provide the technical expertise, mm -hmm. um, who, has, who has the knowledge of, you know, safety rules and policies. And another one who has more influence over the people around him because he works in the department, he works in the office, okay? Yeah. And I think that an ongoing relationship is very important. So especially if the second group of safety champions that I was talking about do not do it as part of their KPI. You know, they're not, they're not paid to do safety. They're just yep. doing it because they believe in it. They want to work with you to help um, the people around them, influence the people around them so that they can be safer. So if these people are not being paid or it's some kind of secondary appointment for them, it's very important to keep them engaged and keep the conversation going with them because they can be demotivated. They would say, I do all these things and I'm not, I'm not remembered by you or I'm not being recognized by you. Mm. Um, yeah. So we have to keep getting, you know, building that relationship with them and also let them know that we are here to support them. So we're not throwing them into the deep end to say, do our work for, for us. We're here to partner you. You know, if possible, if you have a very enlightened uh, management team, you can say, can we budget some resources to train them? 
or yep. to send them to conferences just to motiv- motivate them and let them know that what they're doing is actually very important. Yeah, I, and, and I think that that that's something that I do wonder about, whether or not, you know, we engage champions because mm. you're absolutely right when you said, you know, if you've got one person responsible for health and safety in a big institution, you're never going to be able to really bring about the change that you want. And so you that's need right. those, yeah. you need those champions. And that's that's a challenge that I think everybody faces. But then you've got to you've got to remember that they're they're almost volunteer they are volunteers in many ways. Exactly. I mean, yeah. And that it, it's great, you know, people that believe in the same cause as you but you get recognised because that's your job. You're measured against it at the end of the year. You get your performance review if you have a performance review. Uh, and at, at the minimum, hopefully, you're being paid. I mean, it's hopefully. But the volunteers need to know, need to need to feel that efforts, small or large, mm. are acknowledged and they are valued. And I think it's interesting because I did an interview with Dan Arley and mm. um, he was talking about the power of value in terms of when people value something or they feel valued, the impact it has upon the process of making decisions. Mm. And so if you leave somebody who's doing lots of work for you but doesn't feel valued in return, how long is that relationship going to last? And when it goes when it goes sort of sour, okay, actually what does that do to the brand of health and safety in that function? Yeah. And that's uh, this is the thing about you know listening to people as well because you know often we see campaigns to drive awareness around any subject are very driven about we're pushing information out, but how much how much of our time do we actually spend listening? Mm, that's right, and I think that it should be a two way communication um, when it comes to you know, with your safety champions. Yeah, and but how does that apply when you think go back to you as an individual? Mm. Okay, with X thousand students and then X thousand colleagues, what's your capacity to listen to the people that are ultimately your customer? I mean, I like to see employees and personnel as being my customer. I've got this great product. It's called Information Security. I really want you to buy into it. Okay, and by buy into it, what I mean is here are the policies, processes and procedures. I really want you to I want make you aware of it and then I want you to buy into it and not only buy into it once, I want you to come back. But that whole thing about I, I need to be able to listen, I need to understand my customer. How important is that to you when you look at health and safety? How important is it in that process of designing campaigns to go out there and almost do like market intelligence? I think it's very important. So we need to get down to that root cause of why they are not complying. Why do they not think safety is important? Why do they not be interested in safety. If we can listen and find that root cause, we can address a lot of the issues in that way. So I think we need to speak their language. We need to understand what is it that they're most concerned about Mm. before we can address it. So let's say we are talking to the bosses and they say we are most concerned about productivity, we are most concerned about how much money we can make. Then you can tweak your safety message to say that Safety can help you increase productivity because people will be coming to work motivated. They will feel safe. Uh, We will not have any downtime from sick leave. Um, Mm. If the workers are more concerned about going home safe to their family, uh, they're more concerned about not losing their job because they got into an accident, then you tweak your safety message and get to that. That is their concern. How do we package our safety policy program so that it hits them in the right place. Mm. So I think if we don't don't understand them, we don't understand their needs, we cannot have this targeted intervention that I think would be so much more effective and would save a lot of our time um, instead of, you know, just blasting it out to all of them as if they are all the same. That's very interesting because that comes back to, I was having a chat with what we call CISO, so Chief Information Security Officer, somebody that you would either Mm. expect to see on the executive board or or at least a level below. And one of the things we were talking about there was this exact point, which is that Mm. one size doesn't fit all. 
Mm. <laughs> okay, it tends to fit nobody. It, you know this idea, but the reason why people do that, take that approach, don't tailor things as you suggested, is because of the economics. And people will turn around and go, "Well, surely to tailor something is going mm. to cost me more." And in your experience, is that one of the challenges you come across with health and safety as well? Is yes, we want to raise awareness. Yes, we want to influence behaviour. Um, mm. But actually, the you know we're going to take this. We're going to have one communication approach and we're mm -hmm. going to apply that to everybody, even though we understand that the best form of communication is to tailor those messages. But the, the pushback is that's going to cost more. Do you think it generally costs more or do you think that, yes, it might cost more, but you get a better return on investment? Yes. Yeah, so I think it'll cost more and get a better invest, um, investment return. But we don't always do it because we just have no time. Yeah. We don't have the resources. You know, we have only... 50 safety officers, you know, servicing thousands of students and stuff. So we can't, we can't do that all the time. Mm. So I think there are a few strategies to um, address that. So number one, to prioritize. So which areas are the most high hazard? Yeah. What are we most concerned about? Are we most concerned about those who are sitting in the office? Or are we most concerned about those who are in the laboratories handling really hazardous chemicals? Yeah. So then we can address those high heads at once first, target our energy and our priorities there. And even addressing these different groups of people would require different types of, um, you know, messages to them. So in a way, prioritizing the higher heads at, uh, groups of people would help to target our interventions. And the second thing is, I think it goes back to my safety champion. So even if I cannot listen to my thousands of staff and students, I can listen to my safety champions. And because they are coming from the offices, the departments, they are bringing, they are the representative of the office, you know, they are bringing that voice of concern to you um, as the representative of the office. So it's really important to listen to them because listening to them is like lis listening to the department, listening to the entire office. And, um, uh, you know, these safety champions also sometimes get the, the brunt of it. You know, they get the complaints and they get the unhappiness that's coming from departments. So we have to listen to them because, you know, they get all these information um, that we may not be able to get if we are just working alone. Mm. Yeah. And do you do you promote your safety champions in the sense that everybody in their department knows that they that that individual is a safety champion or is that... Because I could think if you promote that, then could that in a way stop people wanting to talk about safety very openly about the challenges that they face? Because they know that there is a there is a there is an ear that's listening or there's two ears that are listening mm. and that they might be reporting back. And mm. it, it sometimes and, and that's quite interesting because from a deeply on a national cultural perspective, mm. um, you know, there are there are definite cultures where um, you have to respect that that structure, that hierarchy, and that you don't challenge mm. the next level above you. So I'm just wondering in your experience, do, mm. do you see that as a challenge to getting accurate feedback? Because that's the thing, you can get feedback. And we know mm. that people will, in surveys, people will often tell you what they think you want to hear. Mm. So how do you tackle that with this sort of champion network to make sure that actually the feedback you are getting is as close to, 100% accuracy or 99% accuracy so that the decisions you make, the, the, the way you analyse that data is provides the best benefit? Mm. So in our situation, um, the, the safety champion is uh, known to everyone. So they know that this person has been appointed as mm. the safety champion. So this person has that visibility. Uh, how we try to tackle that is, it's, it's a bit different if that person is actually a part of the department already, mm -hmm. as opposed to it being a safety person who is being injected into the department. And then, you know, so if this person has already been part of the department, they are trusted by their peers in the department. Mm -hmm. And then we say that now you are the safe person. Um, we find that that's actually very useful because they already trust this person. Yeah. And if you that now, if I have any safety concerns or feedback, or complaints, I can go to this person to let them to let them tell these safety people what we want and what we need. They don't become the enemy, they become the messenger that 
will help us bring our feedback to the safety office. So it's, it's a bit different. They don't see them as the target. You know, they see them as the person who will help open up the doors and open up, you know, all the channels of communication now. And that, that really helps us when we are crafting our policies. Yeah. Okay. Now, can I just ask you a question on the policy side of things? Who, who writes the policies? Who, who, writes your hmm. health, who writes the health and safety policies? Well, the safety office is in charge of that. So basically the corporate office, um, that is managing the safety of the whole university is in charge of that. But of course, we do not do it unilaterally. So we will bring it up to the senior management. They have to be the ultimate approvers of this policy so that they take ownership and they take responsibility for the safety of their employees and their students. Mm-hmm. So that part's very important. We, we, we can draft it, we can write it, but the person who really needs to own it would be our senior management. Okay. Okay, and because one of the things that we, we we've stumbled across a few times now is where a subject matter specialists in the information mm. security function is asked mm. to write a policy, and um, they write it, and then they sort of the phrase we you know they put it through a peer review process, normally within the sort of you know security function, but maybe bringing in HR or, or you know another department. Mm. Uh, and then it gets signed off, just like you're you're mentioning there. So it gets signed mm. off by the the um, senior leadership team, so they mm. take ownership of it in effect. But then that policy goes out to the employees, the personnel, the contractors that are working with you, and and often you find where people go, I, I don't get it, okay, mm. because mm. it sometimes you get documents which are written by subject matter specialists, and obviously mm. when when you read it as another subject matter specialist, you understand it. Okay, but mm. I, in, in, in my experience, just because I understand what I write, it doesn't necessarily mean that anybody else is going to understand. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> and doesn't mean it will interest them to read it either. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you're already, you know, you've written that document. Of course, you're going to think yeah. it's a great document because yeah. the I- IKEA effect, it's your document. Okay. Yeah. And if you reviewed it and you're one of the subject matter uh, specialists and you're part of that team, you're going to have a sense of the values within that document are values that are probably common to all of you in that team. But the problem is you're not trying to convince yourself. Yeah, you're trying to convince everyone who's going to read that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So have you ever thought about bringing somebody in, like a copywriter, somebody that just writes for a living, okay, and asking them to, you know, can you just have a look at these documents? We think they're great, but we just wonder whether or not people actually read them and, you know, and if they do read it, do they remember them? And, you know, because ultimately, if I'm going to influence behaviour by using these policy documents, mm. you know, somebody's got to read it for a start to have a chance mm. that they're going to remember it to then have a chance of them influence behaviour. So ha- have you ever considered that at all? I think we have not tried that. So we've, we've tried this one uh, one technique or some, this, this strategy once where we, even before we write the policy, we went to the people and did some focus groups before we actually wrote the policy to see uh, what they actually want in that in that policy. So yeah. what, what they would like to see in it. So it, it, that would help to uh, interest them a bit more. Uh, but when we were writing it, we didn't, we haven't tried to engage someone, you know, who is totally not a safety person um, to do it, you know, in layman terms. So, but that, that's a great, great suggestion. <laughs> Something yeah. that we can think about, yeah. Well, I think the idea that you mentioned there about getting the groups of people together before the mm. policy's written, mm. you know, because I'm an absolute believer. I, you know, I often use security. I, I've already mentioned it today, where, you know, security is a product. And yeah. generally, the products that sell best, generally, there's always an exception yeah. to the rule. Okay, But the products that sell best have been designed with the customer in mind. Yes. Okay. And um, there are lots of examples of how people's behaviours are influenced in what appears to be a relatively irrational way. You know, one of the great, I always look back at Steve Jobs, uh, you know, from, from Apple and, and what he designed. I mean, you know, he, the reason why people paid that extra to own a Mac over a PC, okay, ultimately, when you really boiled it down, 
it looked great, so it was attractive, and that's fantastic. But it was the usability. Mm, that's right. Yeah, it was the fact that it didn't have the friction that you were talking about earlier. Mm. You know, mm. I want to move from this product to this one. How how easy can you make it for me? And mm. they designed it by actually sitting down with people and understanding people's needs. Um, mm. And there's a guy called John Pollock who um, was a speechwriter for uh, the ex-US pres- president, um, Bill Clinton. And in his book, Shortcuts, he talks about this this example of how they drew an analogy between the desktop and then creating the the electronic desktop. And they were like, well, we'll just make Mm. it easy. We move it from what people normally see on a desktop Mm. to what they're going to see on our Mac. Um, And that whole process of trying to just make it really easy by, by getting people to design it, in effect, led to one thing. People basically paid how much extra for a Mac? (laughs) <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> that, that's it i mean you look at it and you go oh, yeah. it, that's completely irrational it's sort of doing yeah. what my what my pc does okay yeah. but people have to pay in some cases you know almost twice as much as what you might pay for a pc now that's irrationality yeah. and and then it's, i think it's interesting that it sort of points to the fact that when you do get your customers together and you do engage them to come up to help you define your product your mm. policy, your process, your procedure, that actually yeah. they've bought into it. Yeah, and, and so instead of writing that policy and then trying to figure out after that how to make it more digestible or you know more palatable to your people, why design it in a way that they would want it already? That would help get it across much easier, yeah. Yeah, and I think going back to, you know, that if you've got those people involved and they really bought into it, you know, most most evidence from workshops done around anything. I mean, I was reading some research around how people were being trained on uh, financial planning for retirement because that's mm. a big challenge across a, a lot of different countries. And one of the things they were sort of pointing out was that actually, you know, people would go to these workshops and they would really leave really, really fired up. Mm. But then in that case, the problem was that they left fired up, but their actual follow-up wasn't that strong. But that was the process of they didn't keep that. They didn't maintain that level of engagement. But I think what you've got here is if you involve people in the design of the product, they then naturally make good champions. Yeah, that's right. And so you imagine if you just invited, you think, okay, we've got five policies here that we've got to write up. Mm. Um, Why don't we interview five different groups of people as part of that design process rather than one group. So you get five different groups and then suddenly you're like, okay, if each group has 10 people and we're doing five, that suddenly means we've got 50 people that feel they've contributed to mm. you know, the, the health and safety policy uh, framework. That's 50 champions. and then mm, That's right. Yeah. And that goes to the momentum piece you were talking about earlier as well, when we, we were sort of like that challenge of, You've got to get people on the go. And then once the momentum builds and people see the behaviours around them, the cu- which is the cultural um, piece, that actually the momentum just keeps it keeps building, doesn't it? It's like a, 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 a stone that rolls down the hill. Yes. The initial heartbeat yes. is getting it rolling, but then the momentum continues. So, hmm. so I, And I think the, the thing you mentioned about the irrationality thing. So let's say, let's go back to the example of the safety glasses. Yeah. You know, everybody hates this policy, you know, that we have to wear the safety glasses. But when you start to involve these people in the little focus groups to ask them, um, you know, what are the challenges with wearing your safety glasses? What would you like to see? You know, slowly when the policy comes out, you realize, hey, I don't like this safety glasses thing, but I had a say in this policy. So now I have to feel like, you know, I have some ownership in it. Mm. I am part of it already. So I, the, the adoption would be a bit better with that because they feel like, I can't say that, you know, I, I want to reject that because I gave my opinion in the forming of that policy. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's a bit irrational, you know. I didn't like it, but now I, I'll just take it because I had a say in it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is one of the, I think it's the interesting things when I was having a chat with Dan Arley, uh, he's, he's a behavioural psychologist and very strong background around behavioural economics, is the sense that people make choices, they make decisions using the automatic side of the brain and that the Mm. actually automatic side of the brain has this range of quite well-documented biases and heuristics now. And if you actually understand them, 
so for example, one of those biases is the IKEA effect, that people value yep. things that they've made themselves. You use that and you go, okay, so if we know that people are going to make choices about whether or not to put those safety glasses on, and they're probably going to be influenced by, you know, these biases that are on, going on, how do we incorporate that in how we design our campaign? Mm, that's right. Yeah. And, and I think it's, it's also understanding the people. So it's back to that point about, you know, how we understand what they are concerned about, what is it that they already believe and how do we, you know, target these campaigns to address that? Yeah. So um, there was a point you made right back at the the beginning. So we, we sort of mentioned mm. friction and feedback. And this is another mm. one of what I call salience, which is um, relevance to people. So um, presenting things in a context which people understand already. Mm. And the other one uh, around the salience piece as well is this sense of um, frequency, this idea that people sit there and go, okay, yeah, that could happen. But how people are much more likely to change their behavior if they or they know somebody has been through, has spilt something on their eyes, for example, in the Mm, lab. mm. And, you know, if it happened 20 years ago, actually how over, even though it's happened to an individual, how over a period of time, quite often a lot of people will still seem to think, well, it only happened once in my lifetime type of thing. Mm. How do you overcome that mm. that point of frequency? When, Because there mm. is an argument that if you tell people the bad news, i.e. we've had all these incidents, that that actually justifies for many people why they shouldn't comply. You know, I know in the UK, for example, um, there was there, we had some riots in the UK down in London a number of years ago. And when they interviewed a number of the people that had actually been caught shoplifting um, or mm-hmm. looting, sorry, uh, stores and stealing TVs, that sort of thing. These people already had TVs. These people had disposable income, plenty of disposable income, which would enable them to buy one. Um, and actually what a number of people were pointing out was that actually when, when people see that other people do things, okay, that in a way that sort of justifies for them, they say, well, I know I shouldn't do that, but other people do that and there's evidence of it. I can see it around me or maybe I'm seeing reports or statistics and that sort of helps people think, oh, so I'm not, I wouldn't be the odd one out if I did this. So just that whole frequency piece. Hmm. Do you report to try and address the fact that people will make decisions by thinking about what they've experienced recently? Okay, so if it hasn't, if it doesn't happen frequently, they're not experienced in, in in that. They're less likely to comply with what you're asking them to do. How do you mm-hmm. address that? Mm-hmm. Because most people would turn around and go, "Well, we let people know about all the bad things that happen," but actually, there's a that's counter. So there's a counterintuitive thing going on there because actually that partly says to people that these incidents are happening. It's mm. almost like other people are doing that. That's other people's yeah. behaviour. So it becomes a norm, right? So it's like, this guy's not wearing safety glasses, so why should I? And then it becomes a norm to not wear it. So I think, as I have mentioned, I think sometime earlier, that your safety culture of the place would define how they work, how much risk they will tolerate, and how it deals with accidents or near misses. And I think that the last one, how it deals with accidents and near misses can change that because if we can build an environment where there is a lot of trust, that we, that there is no blame, that people are open to talk about the consequences and what might happen so they can share their near misses, they can share the consequences of the accidents without the fear of being punished, people will start to understand that consequence. So it's so I understand what you mean by, you know, when you when everyone starts doing it, you think that maybe I should be doing it as well. But are they talking about that consequence? Are they talking about what comes after what you do? What comes after that behavior? That's a chemical gets splashed into your eye, mm. um, that you go blind. So are you talking about that consequence, but in a way that is factual and doesn't put blame, but it should be in a way that would, share the lessons learned from the accident or that near miss so that everyone won't have to, you know, it won't need to happen to anyone else around them. So I think having that trust and no blame kind of culture would really help to 
talk about that consequence part and not so much of that behavior. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. The whole thing about um, creating an environment where people can share the sort of the insights that you as the health and safety um, uh, manager you can't be everywhere. So you, you want to create an environment where people will come and engage with you or the local champion and let them know about what's going on. Because if you, that's, that's, that's going to be one of the best ways of actually um, being able to manage the problem. You know, if you're not aware of these things and how can you manage them? And, and there is a fear. I think you're right. There is a fear that people think, well, if I bring this forward, what's the, 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 the repercussion? It's almost like, you know, that people have whistleblower policies but people don't blow the whistle. And mm. um, I think it's an interesting point that you have got to create that environment where people feel that they can come forward. Uh, yes. Yeah. And I think what you mentioned about the frequency, so when we think that this doesn't happen to me, you know, it, it just doesn't happen around here. Is it really because it doesn't happen or is it because you don't hear about it? And why do you not hear about it? Is it because you don't have a, an environment that's safe for you to talk about it, to talk about it without being punished or disciplined. So, you know, that whole, it won't happen to me, might be able to change because then you start to hear more about it from your friends, mm. from your peers, from your colleagues, um, that something like that did almost happen to me or did happen to me and look at what was the outcome, what was the consequence. Yeah, now, that's a point. You use the word consequence there. And I was, I was involved in a discussion recently where this was one of the things that came up, the sense that people were... Um, employees felt a little bit like you know they've done the training they've passed the tests but they saw other people um, who were choosing not to comply who were then potentially being caught mm. um, but then they weren't there was no consequence to them mm. now and, and I think it's quite an interesting one because in one hand this is the thing about the, the whole China trust you want to open up and say come and speak to us about the problems but is there a line that you draw? You know, is there a line which says, okay, after we're going to we're gonna have an open door, an amnesty, if you want to think of it, for the next year for people to come and tell us about, the, you know, why they're having to break the policy? And I think that's really, for me, if mm. I've designed the product, the policy, not very well, and people feel they have to break it to get the, their job done, mm. okay, and I want to know about it, so I've got an opportunity to improve the design. Mm, that's um, right. But then he's like, how long do you leave that door open for people to break policy and keep coming back to you? You know, is it inf yeah. inf is it infinite or do you turn around and say, look, we're going to have an, an amnesty for the next year whilst this is embedded. This is your time to come and talk to us. Yeah, I think after you have that new policy that you put in place and then you get all these policy breakers coming back to you again and again and then you wonder is it me? Is it my policy or is it him? Is yeah. it because he is being <laughs> negligent or is he being, he just doesn't want to do it because he doesn't want to do it. Yeah. So I think after a while, if you keep getting all these um, feedback and you feel that your policy is fine, I think we need to draw a line to say that if their actions is a result of negligence or if the accident occurred because they did not want to comply um, out of negligence and they just try to be, you know, funny in that way. Mm -hmm. Then we should draw that line to say that we need to have some consequence for this person. We cannot just keep letting him do it again and again and again. Yeah. And I read this um, really interesting thing about how do you then decide what is considered negligence? What do you consider an unacceptable social behavior mm -hmm. amongst uh, the organization? So you can find a few people and give them, the same situation. So in this situation, would you do this? Would you do this? And then from there, if you if you have your group of people in the same organization or company saying the same thing, that they would have done it that way, mm. then you have to think, is this then actually a socially acceptable behavior? And then you can reflect to see whether your policy is making it really hard for them to comply. But if the other five guys say that I am not going to do this in this situation, then it also gives you an idea of whether this person is really just being naughty himself um, yeah. and not following the social norms of the rest of, of the people around him. Yeah. Yeah. And there are people that um, take pride in the fact that um, they, they, they think they're 
they're indivi- you know everybody's an individual but you know they, they take pride in the fact that they don't comply they don't agree with things mm. you know there are yeah. people like that um yes. But then I guess as an organization, you need to make a decision that if you've defined your, if the executive have defined its appetite for risk as A, and your policy is there to manage risk in line with that, and then Mm. after a period of time, you find that you've got resistance in certain areas, certain Mm. individuals, then the organization needs to make a decision about whether or not to hold those people to uh, uh, responsible or That's maybe right. change their appetite for risk. But if they do change their appetite for risk, it needs to be reflected and then everybody else needs to know so that you've got as close as, as, close as possible, you, it's an even playing ground for everybody so that nobody feels like they're doing more than they need to and nobody feels hard done by when, when other people aren't held to account, uh, you know, having done all the work that they needed to do, you know. So, hmm, mm. okay. So, um can I ask, with your with your background, the challenges of you know awareness, behaviour, and culture, what is it that you've done in terms of understanding? Because you mentioned the word root cause, I'm big fan of the need to understand the root cause behind this. What is it that you did to go away and try and understand what is the root cause behind people's behaviours? So okay, so let me think about that for a sec. So how did I go about understanding the behaviors, uh, the root cause of their behavior? Um, I think we did a lot of it through conversation. So um, we had different platforms. So when we come up with something new or we come up with, um, you know, we want to develop a new program that would we, we think would benefit them, we engage them in a lot of ways. So uh, we send out surveys, we meet them face-to-face in focus groups, we send out our people to talk to the departments, um, especially in the form of the safety champions, um, to understand uh, what makes them tick before we come up with that policy or new program. Right. Um, so so we, we use different platforms to try and get as much information as we can. And it's not just people on the ground, but with our management team as well, because if the management team is saying one thing and the People, our employees, our students saying a different thing and then we come up with something that just doesn't match either one of it. Um, <laughs> yeah. that, that won't work. So we need to also um, look up as well as look down um, to get a, you know, something that, is, that will match both of their expectations and needs. Yeah. So it's really through a lot of engagement in different, via different platforms that we get that information. Yeah. It, it's the engagement piece. It's about you becoming aware. Mm. And I think this is an interesting... You see, when, when I think about awareness, I think as an industry, in my industry, what we seem to be talking about is the awareness of others, trying to help raise other people's awareness. But actually, mm. um, part of... And this has come out from our conversation, and it's, it's definitely something that's come out from other interviews that we've done with, with, with guests on, on the show... Part of that is as much about us becoming more aware as the people that design mm. these programs to make them mm. as effective as possible. It's as much about our own levels of awareness mm. and increasing those to enable us to better define things. And what you were just talking about is that you know, the workshops, the surveys, these are all means mm. of you raising your own awareness about the environment and the people that you're trying to, to influence. Mm isn't it mm, yeah and you know we're not involved in the operations of their business we are not the ones who are doing whatever they're doing day in day out so it's very hard for us to understand you know what exactly how exactly our policies will affect them if we don't ask them mm. we can put in, in a, you know, a lot of new paperwork but how is that you know going to affect them in terms of their job you know their operation so i think if we can get that knowledge from them we can then come up with policies that are a bit easier for them to 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 follow so that's where we come back to you know it being very frictionless uh, because we already know what they need yeah right well is there anything that you go to as a resource to help you be motivated to be inspired to become creative around you know the challenge of awareness behavior and culture within your context you know is there something that you that helps you think 
at all you know is it your is it just looking out there for posts upon linkedin or are there any books that you've read that you thought that was really interesting is there anything like that mm. that you, you might be able to go hmm i think i get my inspiration from a few places so um, i use linkedin quite a lot i'm quite active on um, linkedin because i get so much information not just about safety but about different areas and i think that's what you're trying to do as well you know you're trying to get lessons learned from different industries that you can uh, apply to your um, area of expertise so that's one way i can get my inspiration from so uh, friends i've made on linkedin yeah um i also use a lot of papers so journal articles so i come from a research background and i'm very interested to see how research in safety is being done and what they have what they can find from there and because it's you know they use the scientific method it's it's something that i can trust as a information source so i think um, that's another resource that I use quite a lot. Mm-hmm. And just for motivation, you know, I I think I get it from the people around um, the universities, just my, you know, passion to make sure that they are coming to a very safe environment. And I think that keeps me um, going. So I've just this one example, um, just a couple of weeks back, we had this gentleman who had a heart attack right outside our office. Right. Just right outside. And I thought to myself, oh, thank goodness he had his heart attack outside the safety office because we are all trained. And I thought, you know, how great would it be if every single person in the university could be trained and could be just as aware as myself and my colleagues, you know? And I think this is something that keeps me going that there's so much more that can be done so that we can start becoming our brother's keeper that we can start looking out for someone who is next to me who's near me and i think that just motivates me yeah you were able to realize the benefit of of, of that you know you had an individual who's very seriously ill obviously and then being able to mm. help them and you know how good that makes you feel I think, you know most people would walk away from that situation feeling that they have done good and actually that's one of the things i think drives most people you know when we talk about rewards earlier and mm. we talk about mastery but it's also mm. most people want to do good they want to be recognized for doing good um they mm. want to, you know and and yeah it's a powerful thing it's a very very powerful thing and, and if you've done good and you want to share that with other people and and, and that's that's really important that's a very personal motivator so i can completely understand where you're coming from on that one mm-hmm. okay well look it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show i knew it'd be interesting having a chat with you uh anybody that puts up a dancing traffic light has got to be <laughs> interesting um yeah. so uh yeah it would be it'd be fabulous to catch up with you some other time maybe later in mm. the year and to carry on the conversation um of course yeah. but you know in the meantime absolute pleasure thank you very much for joining us i am 110 percent confident that our listeners our community are going to find that really really helpful thank you very much oh it's my pleasure and i feel really privileged that you invited me to this podcast and i hope that our listeners would be able to get some lessons from safety and health that they can apply in the cyber security field thank you very much thank you Well, I knew that having a chat with Sui Wong would be really interesting. When I first saw the article that uh, Sui uh, shared on LinkedIn and took a step back and took the time to consider it, you know, what became quite apparent is that Sui is sort of plugged into, you know, the behavioral aspects there. And I wanted to reach out to her and sort of get her onto the show. And the other reason I wanted to reach out to her and get her on the show is that I'm a great believer that part of the challenge we face as people responsible for education and awareness, behavior and culture is that, you know, you can often design things in isolation of the audience that you're actually trying to work with. It's not unusual in my experience to find people maybe based in the UK or mainly in Europe or North America who are designing education and awareness programs which have got to be rolled out across a number of different countries all over the world. And my research into culture and awareness specifically has highlighted the fact that you know, we all bring our own cultural lenses and insights and biases and we don't necessarily recognise them. We don't recognize that we have them. I think Gert Jan Hofseed in his interview spoke about 
that our culture is something that we just cannot see. We don't recognise it immediately and we definitely don't seem to recognise that actually it's going to have such an impact upon how we interpret information, our experiences, our encounters day in, day out. And with that in mind, I just think it's really important for the podcast to reach out to people outside of Europe, UK, North America and Australia and, and actually engage with those people because, you know, these campaigns around cybersecurity need to engage with these audiences. And so we have to be cognizant of the fact that they have their own cultural lens and biases, and that's going to have an impact upon the effectiveness of the campaign. So, you know, speaking to Sui today, hopefully it's highlighted maybe some of those differences, but also I think maybe some of the similarities that run through any particular culture. So, Absolutely fantastic to have her on the show. Uh, hopefully, we'll get her back on maybe towards the end of the year. We'll see how busy she is. But before I wrap up, I just want to gently remind you that the new book is out in six weeks and you can pre register. You can get a free chapter by going to amamlebox.com and scroll through the pages there and you'll be able to find the free chapter. Also, just so they know, we've got the rebranding exercise coming through. So if you're sort of familiar with the, the, the Rethinking the Human Factor brand, the Marmalade Box brand, just the heads up that we're in the process of rolling out the new brand. That should be completed by the end of September. But if you've got any thoughts on the new branding, please do share those with us as well. On a final note, for those of you that are really interested in the work that we've been doing, you know, we've uh, presented recently at InfoSec in London, what we're talking about in this podcast – just to let you know that um, we have a workshop which is running on September the 10th, and it's all about introducing people to the Rethinking the Human Factor philosophy and how it challenges the current way that we as security professionals view the challenge of the human factor. And by doing that, it sort of creates a new opportunity for there's a slight changes in direction, which I believe will be of significant value in terms of helping us with awareness, behaviour and culture. Thank you very much for joining us on the show. I uh, hope that you can join us again very soon. Our next podcast is due to come out in five weeks' time. If you want to stay abreast of what the changes are, then please you know, go to the marmaladebox.com website and uh, sign up to be kept informed of the new podcast or alternatively sign up to the RSS feed as well. If you like the podcast, we'd love to know. Please do let us know. Um, you can do that by you know, rating us on uh, iTunes and um, or sending us an email just to let us know privately what you're thinking of the podcast and what we're doing in terms of helping you rethink the human factor. Thank you for your time.